With no further ado, um, I would like to present today um, Olivier and Jonathan. Uh, I think most of you know Olivier, uh, who is a account manager uh, in, at Google Belgium, who manages the biggest accounts uh, of the country. He spends also most of his time in data, in data so he will um, uh, share uh, interesting insights with you. And Jonathan is coming from the UK, um, heads uh, a part of the retail 100 billion euro business, you know, influenced by internet uh, uh, in, in the UK. So just to give you an idea, Belgium is just getting to uh, 1 billion. Uh, so if you compare the two guys, one of them is 100 times heavier than the other. Even if it doesn't look like that. Um, most of all, Jonathan comes from Australia. And he told me yesterday that he was a rodeo rider <laughs> in Australia. So uh, that you also see the backside. Yeah, <laughs> I uh, leave you the, the word, thanks. Thank you, Julien. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today, Ms. Uh, Jonathan will be uh, talking about Measure the Gap. Measure the Gap means that uh, we would like to do a comparative study where we would actually assess uh, the position of UK uh, compared to Belgium. Yes, thank you for having me here. You can see a photo of me on my summer holidays last year. <laughs> and we're not here to say one market is better or worse than the other, but just to look at the differences. In the United Kingdom, the consumer has really embraced the internet. And uh, we've had to make up a lot of things as we go because there's no real market to look to for, for experience or, or to learn from. We think that's an advantage to you here in Belgium where perhaps you can look at some mistakes of others and what others have done well and make uh, some decisions a little more efficiently perhaps. And you might think that actually uh, those two markets are not really comparable, but if you look, for example, at GDP per capita, I mean, Belgium and the UK has almost the same level at $31,000 per capita. If you think now in terms of history and you look at the Industrial Revolution, for example, uh, back to the 19th century, uh, Belgium was the second leading country in terms of uh, industrial uh, penetration just behind the UK. Uh, we were also at that time uh, like a superpower economically. So the first thing we will see today is like how to quantify the gap. So I hope it is not a surprise for you that Belgium is lagging behind the UK, but we will try to put this on a scale in order to do a benchmark. Absolutely, just like the industrial revolution comparison, we're in a digital revolution now, just at the very beginning of it. So it'd be very interesting to see where it might end to. Afterwards, once we have done this benchmark, we'll try to understand the reasons why in order to pull out some leverage of action that can be done. And then, finally, Jonathan will share with us some insights and some actually advice that we can learn from the UK market. So let's jump into the presentation. Let's go. So this first slide is uh, showing you here some Eurostat figures. And you can see here the e-commerce penetration in terms of individuals that made a purchase the last past 12 months. And actually, uh, it is linked to Julien's question, but you can see here that Belgium is at 38% for 2010, just lagging a bit behind the EU average. Yes, you can see in the UK, nearly 70% of the population have, have purchased something online. Most people are very comfortable now. It's not just the early adopters who may have been younger or, or more adventurous that were on three or four years ago. Many of the uh, more traditional part of the population is now buying from the trusted brands that they've used to and bought to traditionally offline and now buying from them online as well. And tell me, Jonathan, uh, when was the, the moment in the UK where you, you really had this uh, momentum of uh, e-commerce growth? 2005, 2006, I think a lot of traditional businesses realised the internet was, was not a fad, was not a, a craze, it was here to stay. Amazon had launched a UK-based website, and uh, that's when the, the population really got going online. Well, tell us, uh, what's the most crazy thing you, you bought online? Well, I must admit, I had a, saw a mouse in my flat last, mm -hmm. last year, so I didn't want one that was going to chop its head off and leave guts all over the place. My, my wife would not have liked this, so I went online, did a search, I found a fantastic site, and all they sold was, was mouse traps. And they had a nice one that would trap the mouse but not kill it and let me release it, hopefully run to someone else's house. <laughs> Great story. Yeah. Let, let's look at another, another slide in order to understand a bit, a bit better what's going on in the market. 
And, and this is what we call the Belgian paradox. Um, those are Google internal data that we have compiled, and we are looking on the first chart on the top, actually the numbers of search that are being done by Capital. And you can see that for 10 searches that are being done in the UK markets, there are actually eight searches that have been done in the Belgian market. That's quite good, actually. Uh, that can be also explained, maybe like the small gap can be explained by internet penetration, for example. But now, when we look at conversions, and what is a conversion? A conversion is an action that is being done on a website. Often it is transaction, but it can also be like a sign up or filling up a form, you know. And we see that for 10 conversions that are being done in the UK, there are actually only three conversions that are being done in Belgium. And that is what we call the Belgian paradox. Yes, it's very interesting, and we'll look at this further as we go forward. The UK consumer loves to search, they love to find out information, you can see that they lead the, the absolute volume per capita there of searches. But uh, that's the first stage of coming online, as once you build familiarity and you build confidence, you then start to be more comfortable to buy and go forward. So, and it's interesting that, that this difference is still quite large, isn't it? Yeah, it is, and we'll try to find an explanation to that uh, furthermore into this, uh, into this presentation. Let's go back to the Eurostat data we were, we were presenting a bit earlier. And here you have the evolution perspective. So you can see here the evolution in terms of e-commerce penetration between Belgium, UK, and other peer countries. And if you look at the level in 2010 for Belgium, so around 38%, you can see, you can draw the line and bring that to the level that UK had five years ago, back in 2005. So when we say measuring the gap, we assess here that the gap we have with the UK is up to five years. Five years seems really like enormous, it's huge. What? How, how, yes, would you, how would you explain that, five years? What's it's a hard to gauge, isn't it, in, in the, the digital world? What, what does that really mean? What does that relate to? Um, maybe we can draw an analogy uh, to, to, to phones. So who here has an iPhone? Or an Android phone, hopefully. <laughs> Fantastic, most of you. Who can remember using something like the Nokia? I can remember having one like that four or five years ago. And there's nothing wrong with that. It worked very well. But I bet very few of you here would be willing to trade, trade back now. I'd also like to perhaps guess that you used the iPhone or your Android phone a lot more than you used that Nokia. So it's a case of if you build it, they will come. With all this extra availability, I think, and features, this is what can really enhance and get people using online more here. <coughs> so we, we have seen the, the user perspective in terms of e-commerce, uh, but now we want here to show you the revenue perspective. And here on this graphic, for Belgium, we have put out the open figures that are being released every year, you know, and you can see here that uh, the average revenue in terms of e-commerce that is being done per capita in Belgium it's close to 90 euros in 2010. Yes, you can see the British figures are from uh, the IMRG group that measures e-commerce from retail and from travel. And you can see that nearly well, over a thousand euros per person last year was spent online, over 60 billion for the, for the whole country. You can still see, even at that big level, there's still very healthy growth rates in the United Kingdom of over 10%, but the trend is that the growth is easing. Whereas the Belgian figures show that growth is actually increasing, the growth rate itself, not the absolute amount. So maybe you are coming to your, your real sort of explosion point here. And, and that's the good news. I mean, although obviously here we are below the UK, it seems that the growth rate is higher. So at Google Belgium, I mean, uh, we, we really thought about that and, and we believe that we can catch up with the UK. We really believe that we can grow and reach this level also. And if we would be doing the same level of uh, e-commerce revenue per capita, our forecast would be up to 10 billion euro that can be generated thanks to e-commerce in Belgium. We are talking here about yearly figures. That's a huge amount. So now we have seen that there is this huge potential hanging there. Let's try to understand a bit what is the leverage. And we have made actually uh, some analysis in Google Belgium since many years. We are trying to understand the reasons of why Belgium is lagging behind. Yes, we've established some benchmarks, and I think that's useful because it can help you see where the gaps are greatest and then where they are smallest and, and focus your attention in that respect. So 
What is it you think? We've seen that um, at least search activity or, or usage of online is, is quite equivalent between the countries, but, but purchasing is a lot different. Is it that, um, Olivia, that in Belgium there's a, there's a sort of security fears online of, of payments and so on? Is that, is that what the difference is? Security is, can be a reason, but it is not the main reason here. What about, um, is, it, is it credit cards and this sort of thing? Obviously you need some sort of card to pay online. I know Europeans tend to prefer to use cash, or, or this is what I, what I understand. You, you are a European. <laughs> <laughs> <You can also. laughs> um, credit cards uh, can be a reason, but uh, it's not the main it's reason. Not the main what, what perhaps is the main reason? Actually, when we look uh, at the data, we see that the main reason here, uh, it's because it's consumer habits. Uh, consumers don't have the need actually uh, to purchase online. The shelves are empty, and this is what you can see here on the picture. It is somehow because there is no supply online uh, that really answers the consumer's needs, that somehow it's the chicken and egg theory, you know, like because it, the egg is not there, the chicken is not there, you know. So somehow e-commerce theory is not moving forward. Let, let me show you something else. This is showing you, so this is Google uh, combined data, uh, it's a share of advertisement investments happening in different sectors. And you can see here the Belgian flag, the Belgian share versus foreign investments that are actually coming on our market. And out of those sectors, it is very surprising, and this, this is really like very particular to the Belgian market, this doesn't happen in all the markets, that the majority of those sectors are dominated by foreign investments. Yes, and, and which countries in particular are uh, um, sort of seizing this, this Viking spice in Belgium? So from the data we have combined, 34% of investments are coming from the Netherlands, 30% from France, and around 20% from the UK. Really, so it's all some of your closest closest neighbors, well, what do you think is... Yeah, because, you know, Belgium is just uh, one click away. There is no real ba uh, language barrier happening here, you know. For uh, a website that is .fr.nl, in a few clicks they can directly target the Belgian market and think that they can assess their presence in Wallonia or in Flanders. Do you know the Rue Neuve, Jonathan? I have learned of it here since my, my first time in Brussels, but I hear it's a very famous shopping street. Right. It is indeed a, a very uh, famous. There is also Avenue Louise, very famous. But the, the Rue Neuve is actually uh, one of the most expensive shopping streets you can find in Belgium. And you have their high street retailers that are ready to pay a huge amount of rent just to be present at the Rue Neuve. So the other day I was walking, walking around, you know, in, in the Rue Neuve, and I was like playing this little game with myself and trying to see, okay, out of the shops that are present here on the Rue Neuve, how many of them have a fully functional e-commerce website localized in Belgium. By that I mean speaking the correct language, uh, proposing interesting shipping costs, you know, um, those, those kinds of things. And actually, the figures are quite astonishing. Yes, sir, we certainly are um, surprised to see this, this small rate. In the UK, as I mentioned, e-commerce e represents 10% of all retail sales around 7% of GDP, according to a recent report we did with the Boston Consulting Group. Um, and we certainly don't propose that, that all goods will eventually be bought online. We don't think that will be the, the end result. But in some categories like uh, DVDs and music, over 50% is, is already sold online. For consumer electronics, it's above 20% sold online. So with such a large chunk of the whole market coming through online, uh, traditional retailers, high street retailers, have not been able to ignore uh, e-commerce anymore. So they have created web stores. You can see for furniture and home and garden and so on, it, it makes sense, it's intuitive that people want to go and see the sofa, see the bed before they buy it. So it's not so much a need, but for certain categories, it's essential now to have a, a fully operational web store. Indeed, Jonathan. And maybe you can share with us some insights, or maybe you can give us some advice on how we can build the market, the Belgian market together, and maybe you can look at the UK and see a bit what could be the learnings that we can get from the UK. So, you wanted to speak about uh, money supermarkets. Yes, there, there were three themes here we thought we'd touch upon quickly and then and you could learn more about these businesses yourselves, but uh, the first one is a financial aggregator or a price comparison. And the theme here is keeping up with your consumer. There's clearly been a big shift 
most people will agree that a lot of media consumption takes place online now, a lot of the yeah, days of um, hours are spent online. People love to look for bargains and it's very easy online. But to go and compare each each supplier can be hard. So this business thought, let's, let's compile all the feeds, let's make it possible to do it in one place. So they started with one product, uh, insure, uh, home, home mortgages, home loans. Very quickly they rolled out into insurance, into travel, into mobile phones and broadband. You can now get prices from over 100 suppliers for 47 different product categories. So they've done all this in 10 years and grown revenues to over 150 million euros. So that's one example of following your consumer and see where they're going and give them something there. So what's your big hurdle here? Absolutely, do not uh, don't stop at one product. They didn't stop with mortgages. They they saw that, that worked, but they didn't think it was to become the mortgage person. Let's see what else we can give to the consumer and and, show, and, and offer them some value. The second case uh, is about uh, John Lewis. Yes, this is a traditional retailer, sort of, and it's going to be interesting to look at the challenges and how they're integrating the web store into their traditional business. If, if you've been to the UK, you've probably seen one of their department stores. They uh, are now getting 15% of their revenue from their web store. It's, it was about 500 million pounds and 600 million uh, euros last year. What's interesting from this uh, piece of revenue is that 17% of that is what we call click and collect. This is where someone comes to the website, finds a product they like, uh, says I would like to reserve this in a store that they live nearby or near their work perhaps. They get a reference number, they go to the store, the product is waiting for them at the cash register at the special collection point. So it's very good for the busy busy shoppers who tend to be often you know, more affluent workers. It's, a, it's something that is of value to them. But what's also interesting, one in three of these people who come to collect it would make an impulse purchase when they're there. And so that basket value is generally greater as well. So how do they measure, I would say, uh, this impulse uh, shopper? You know, it's a good question. They obviously, when you go to the cash register, you have your receipt for the good you've collected, but then generally the person has one or two other items I've collected on the way through, and the person at the cash register makes the, uh, makes the comment and adds the data. So can, can you, you summarize the learning here? Well, it's, yes, it's about letting the customer, offering them these different channels and letting them cross between the two. Don't say you must start and finish online, the purchase, or start and finish in the store, or start and finish on the phone at the call centre. Your customers view your brand as one unit, whether it's the website, whether it's the store, whether it's your call centre, and they don't care about the challenges of having to match up profit and loss between the two. So you must allow them to move between channels. And if you do, you'll get a lot more loyalty, and they'll tend to spend more with you as well. And, and finally, you had uh, ASOS also. That's right, it's, that's what I've seen on screen. It, it started off as someone who looked at the data they could get from online and saw that people were searching for certain items that were, had been on the television or on the movie recently. So perhaps Jennifer Aniston had wore a unique dress the night before on Friends, something like this. Um, people were searching the next day, Jennifer Aniston dress. So he started to stock these products, bid on these type of searches, saw that he was meeting some demand that had been created here. So very quickly uh, he invested in better product lines in, in his website. ASOS is now growing at about 44%, I think it was last year, over 100% of its international sales. They have a one billion pound revenue goal for 2015. So in only three years away, they'll be a one billion pound business They've invested in a 20 million pound distribution centre. They can ship to Europe in five days and they'll only charge six euros to do this. So they can ship to your, your customers in five days for six euros. They have invested in a German language website, a French, French language website also. So the point here is that you know, when something gets going and you see there's some demand there, you must double down as you say. You must make the big bet quickly because it can really explode and the demand can take off. Thank you for all those uh, insights, uh, Jonathan. And a bit to conclude this presentation, uh, we have seen together, we have measured the gap, and we have seen that obviously Belgium is lagging behind. It has been even seriously lagging behind, like five years, you know, so that's really a lot. But at the same time, in a positive way, it means also that this could represent a huge amount of potential. We at Google, uh, we believe that this could represent up to 10 billion revenue potential 
uh, for um, e-commerce actors here in Belgium. We also think that it is time to move and that uh, if the market doesn't move fast enough, it is somebody else that will take advantage of it. So uh, like our, our two uh, champions here uh, would say, you know, like the ball is in your court. Thank you.